Flo Quentz. Today we're discussing Rosalind Hursthouse's article, Environmental Virtue Ethics. So we're going to see an attempt to apply a virtue ethical framework to specifically environmental issues. Now, we've already seen two other ways of conceiving of how to respond to intrinsic value, right? We've sort of been interested in questions of what has intrinsic value and how to respond to that value throughout the class. So consequentialists like Singer say uh, everything and only things with interests have intrinsic value. Uh, and then furthermore, he thinks that uh, all and only things with consciousness have interests because we have interests in feeling pleasure and interests in not feeling pain. Uh, so all and only the things with interests have intrinsic value. And if you're a consequentialist, the right way to respond to that value is to promote those interests. So whatever has interests out there, you try to get them the most satisfaction of their interests that you can. And again, if you're a singer style consequentialist, that means creating as much pleasure as possible and as little pain as possible. But it doesn't really matter what creatures get the pleasure and pain, you're just aiming at the overall balance uh, that gives you the best uh, total of pleasure over pain. Deontologists like Regan say that everything and only things with intrinsic value have rights. And the correct way to respond to intrinsic value is to respect those rights. So this again uh, ties intrinsic value at least to consciousness. Regan is a little more cagey than Singer is. Uh, he se se certainly seems to think that uh, having consciousness, having the ability to feel pleasure and pain is enough to have intrinsic value. It's less clear if he thinks that's the only way that you can get intrinsic value. But regardless of that question, if you have intrinsic value, then you have rights. And if you have rights, the correct response is to respect those rights. Virtue ethics is really a third alternative that rejects both of these views, or at least reject certain parts of both of these views. Um, it thinks that there is a narrow focus on consequences for people like Singer, and that deontological notions of morality are mainly about putting restrictions on yourself. Uh, so the, the consequentialists say, there's no restrictions on what you do. It just depends on what the outcome is. And deontologists say that morality is all about figuring out what limits there are on what you're allowed to do. Virtue ethics doesn't want to say, okay, what, what can I not do? Rather, it wants to say, how should I respond to moral value in the world? What's the positive account? And its most prominent answer to that is that we should develop positive traits of character, uh, i.e. virtues, that will guide us case by case. So the virtue ethicist is going to say, you'll run into some cases in life where all things considered, the right thing to do is to just maximize the good consequences. That's fair. The consequentialists aren't always wrong. They're just wrong that they think that's the whole picture. And there are some cases where you will have to recognize that someone or something has a right and that you have to respect that right and that that's decisive. Fair enough. But the deontologists, again, go crazy in trying to make that all of morality. In truth, according to the virtue ethicist, things are messy. Sometimes the consequences are super important, sometimes not. Sometimes the rules are super important, sometimes not. So if everything is shifting like that, how do you ever know what the right thing to do is? Well, the answer is develop traits of character. Those traits of character, if they're good traits, i.e. virtues and not vices, 
will guide you. They'll make you see the particular case correctly, and then you'll know what to do. Now, Hearst House thinks uh, as a first move from this general virtue ethical background into environmentalist concerns. Uh, she thinks that all environmentalists endorse something like what she calls the green belief. And the green belief, without getting uh, too detailed, is really just the view that fairly radical change in the way humans engage with nature is a must. It's an imperative. Uh, if we don't, then we're wronging the world, nature, and we're harming ourselves and future generations. So whichever of those you think is more important or most important, you're going to be committed to the green belief as long as you think that we need a radical change in the way humans go about their day-to-day -day lives. And Hearst House claims, I think pretty plausibly, that if you don't believe that, you can't be an environmentalist. So uh, let's assume that we're all on board with the green belief. We're all environmentalists. Uh, how might you try to embrace the green belief if you're a virtue ethicist? Hearst House sees two approaches you might take. One is to reapply classical virtues to the topic of the environment. So we might ask, well, what does courage or generosity tell us about how we should treat the environment? Um, and we have all kinds of classic virtue terms, and really there's even more vice terms. We tend to be more interested in ways of going wrong than going right. But uh, we might ask, uh, how do I avoid cruelty? How do I avoid uh, shallow-mindedness? How do I avoid cowardice, right? These are all vices, uh, classical vices. Alternatively, or in addition to this first approach, you could try to introduce new virtues that specifically deal with the environment. So not taking things that have already historically been recognized as virtues and reapplying them, but actually saying deep thought about the environment and our relation to it should lead us to see new options for what a good character would be like. So let's take option one first. We could argue that, look, environmental degradation is primarily a result of people being greedy, self-indulgent, short-sighted. These are all vices. And uh, most generally, we could say it's a result of people lacking practical wisdom. So people are being foolish as well as greedy and short-sighted. And that's where most of our environmental problems come from. So we could try and uh, get people to move from those vices to their corresponding virtues. Another thing we could point out is that much of the treatment of non-human animals is cruel, another vice. It is lacking in compassion. People. Uh, well, many people don't know, but many more people know in the abstract that factory farming is uh, full of horrendous conditions, but they lack compassion, right? It's all rather fuzzy. They don't have much of a clear notion of exactly what factory farming is like, and they don't really want to know either. Uh, Hearst House would say, uh, that is either out and out cruelty, or at least it's a lack of compassion, a lack of ability to sympathetically identify with what it would be like to be a non-human animal going through uh, experiences like this. We could also talk about aggravating or intensifying vices. So these are not themselves primary failings, at least with respect to our relation to the environment, but they are vices that make the other vices worse. So pride and vanity make us refuse to acknowledge our shortcomings. Uh, there's certainly some people that you try and tell them like, the world is going to be massively unlivable, at least compared to 
the way it is now, if we don't change our uh, rate of greenhouse gas emissions like yesterday. And pride makes them refuse to even take the idea seriously, right? No, there's no amount of data you can show them because they're already characterologically committed to not believing it. So pride is already taking this short sightedness and it's essentially turning up the volume on its badness. Uh, there's also dishonesty, especially in the form of self-deception. Right? This leads us to blind ourselves to relevant facts or to carefully avoid visceral evidence of the consequences of our actions. So going back to factory farming again, uh, there are many states that are passing so-called ag-gag laws that make it illegal to, uh, for instance, to falsely represent your intentions when trying to get uh, employment at a factory farm uh, or uh, otherwise just making it illegal to take photographs inside a factory farm or things like this. The point is uh, these big agriculture conglomerates don't want people to literally and metaphorically see how the sausage is made, right? They don't want to see cows being shoved around with forklifts. They don't want people to see uh, enormous just row upon row upon row of chickens that have had their beaks cut off so they can't peck at each other, uh, right? Because they think, well, as long as I don't have to look at these unpleasant pictures or think about these unpleasant images, I'm just not really motivated to stop eating meat. Um, now, we could ask whether someone who embraces the full facts of what it's like for, uh, or what meat eating requires in order to produce the meat that we eat, maybe someone looks at that with clear eyes and says, you know what, I'm still okay with it. There, they would at least be avoiding the failure of self-deception. Right? We might ask if they have some other vice, but uh, for many people, the ability to casually enjoy being uh, a big meat eater is dependent on not having to think very much about what animals actually go through in order for meat to be available on the scale that uh, we need it to be to keep living the way we've been living. Uh, other intensifying vices, well, cowardice prevents us from promoting unpopular views, even when we think they are right. Uh, interestingly, I think that the biggest example of this is not in the environmental realm, but uh, more broadly in the political realm. Right? Uh, how many people uh, ultimately decide that it's better to just bite their tongues than to get into it on some political topic over Thanksgiving dinner, uh, right? And you now, sometimes that might be the correct assessment, right? If we're being virtue ethicists, then we're going to want to generally take things case by case. So there might be, uh, oh, you've got that one uncle who thinks that uh, we should have a flat tax rate and you think that's wrong and you think, well, if I get into talking politics and economics with him, it'll make dinner unpleasant. And that's just, you know, whether we have a flat tax or uh, a progressive tax, it's not worth getting into it at Thanksgiving over. Fine. Uh, but what about uh, the family member who holds a view that you think is really morally wrong, like reprehensibly wrong? Uh, probably a lot of us have some family member that we know we're going to end up biting our tongues about because we don't want to bother engaging them. Hursthouse would say, you should really ask yourself, uh, are you being prudent? Are you looking out for the comfort of your fellow family members in trying to avoid starting a fight at dinner? 
or are you being cowardly? Are you turn, are you willfully staying silent when someone is saying things that you are quite certain are morally wrong? Uh, and, and that could be true with res regard to environmental issues, but I think it's even more generally true with regard to political issues and people saying, oh, I just don't want to engage uh, Uncle Greg or Grandma Annie or whoever, uh, but that's allowing people to hold morally reprehensible views unchecked. And Hearst House is going to say, that's probably a character logical failing if you're not willing to step up and make some waves. Now there is uh, one classical virtue that seems to be important in the environmental ethics literature, but is largely out of fashion nowadays, uh, at least outside the environmental ethics literature, and that's humility. Uh, it used to be that humility was considered one of the most important virtues. Uh, nowadays, people seem to think that being humble is not particularly a, uh, an impressive character feat. And of course, there are even views on which humility is generally not a virtue at all. There are approaches to virtue ethics that say pride is the virtue uh, and humility is uh, a deficient amount of self-esteem or something like that. But uh, with respect to the environmental ethics literature, there are people that argue for the abandonment of anthropocentric approaches. We've read some of these authors and many of these authors will claim that if we just had a proper humility, that would lead us to see that we're being arrogant when we take like the, a dominance view towards nature, or perhaps even a stewardship view, uh, because we're essentially complimenting ourselves by saying, oh, we have dignity and authority and power and knowledge, uh, and that that gives us the right to meddle in nature or to just use nature however we want. So you can see how someone might say, look, what you need is a good dose of humility. If you start seeing that you're just one kind of animal among many others, that might uh, bring you more into alignment with other general environmentalist beliefs. Uh, so it's not that there aren't any uh, of these classical virtues that we could tap into, but uh, you might still think there's a problem with them being anthropocentric. So uh, there's a philosopher, Tom Hill, uh, who argues for a kind of proper humility, and he says this is uh, a virtue that we need to develop with respect to the environment uh, uh, amongst other things. But in the end, he's really uh, an anthropocentrist because he says, uh, if we don't learn to be properly humble towards nature, we'll probably not be properly humble towards humans. And that's where the real problem is. This is uh, essentially what Immanuel Kant said about non-human animals, and Tom Hill is a big Kant scholar, so it's not surprising to see him bringing this view uh, to the forefront. Uh, but the point, again, is that this is anthropocentric in saying what's really wrong is being arrogant towards human beings. And then in a kind of instrumental way, we say, oh, you should practice your humility towards the environment because then you'll be better at being humble towards other human beings. Uh, that, that's still putting humans at the center. So Hearst House thinks that an environmental ethic, whether it's going to be virtue ethical like she wants or deontological uh, like a Kantian or Hill type view, uh, any environmental ethic needs to demand that we acknowledge directly 
the goods and ills of our actions in relation to nature itself. Uh, the goods of nature cannot be purely parasitic on our relation to other humans, the way uh, Kant, for instance, would have it. And Kant flat out says the only reason that it's morally wrong to uh, torture a cat to death is that it makes it less likely that it would bother you if you saw a human being being tortured, right? If you could hypothetically be guaranteed that it wouldn't change your perspective or behavior on how you treat humans, Kant's sort of committed to saying, well, there just wouldn't be anything wrong with torturing cats uh, because cats don't have rights. They don't have dignity. Um, uh, now, Hearst House is going to disagree with that as a virtue ethicist, right? She's not going to accept this idea of dignity as the sole kind of value or intrinsic value out there, but she's also going to reject this for its anthropocentrism, right? So even if it was true that you could completely divorce treatment of nature from treatment of humans, she's just not going to accept putting nature to one side. And she thinks anyone who's going to accept or deserves to be called an environmental ethicist has to be on the same page as her on that. So Hill's problem is really his Kantianism and a real virtue ethics can shed that, right? So Hill sounds like a virtue ethicist when he talks about the importance of humility, but really he's a deontologist. If we really dig into our virtue ethics, we can do better than Hill does. But what about this second option, coming up with new virtues or vices? Well, this is a pretty big challenge, uh, according to Hearst House, right? It involves articulating a character trait that connects with both actions and emotional reactions, right? Because our actions don't occur in uh, an emotional vacuum, right? If you don't have the right dispositions with respect to your emotions, it's going to be almost impossible to have the right dispositions with regard to acting. So a new virtue would have to be a character trait that sensitizes us to certain considerations across a wide range of circumstances. Right? So just think of something like courage. Uh, for Aristotle, who's my uh, philosophical, or at least virtue ethical hero, I was going to pitch that too widely. He said some pretty terrible things too, but uh, many of the things he said, I think are right. And uh, for him, courage is primarily a battlefield virtue. So it's pretty much just when you're a soldier out fighting that you have to worry about being courageous. I think that was a mistake on Aristotle's part. And I know that Hearst House uh, agrees. She would say you can have or lack courage at the Thanksgiving dinner table. You can have it or lack it uh, in your workplace, right? If you know that, uh, your boss is uh, stealing from the tip jar and so effectively stealing from all of the tipped employees or otherwise engaging in some form of wage theft, but you also know that if you confront him about it, you'll lose your job. Well, a virtue ethicist is going to say it's not immediately clear what you should do, right? It's probably going to depend on further factors but courage is going to be relevant there. It's just as relevant in the workplace as it is on the battlefield. So any new environmental virtue is going to have to have a similar broad significance to our character. It also needs to be something that recognizably fits with human psychology. We could even say something that seems natural to human psychology, at least with a proper upbringing. So here again, uh, taking a note from not just Aristotle, but most of the ancient Greek 
Ephesus, Hearst House thinks uh, we're not born either virtuous or vicious. Uh, we, we might be born with certain individual tendencies this way or that, but really you develop virtue or you fail to develop virtue through upbringing, through the way that your inborn tendencies get shaped during your formative years. So to discover a new environmental virtue, we wouldn't necessarily have to find something that everyone's just born with, but it does have to be something that is compatible with general human psychology. It has to be something that people could, uh, if you like this language, you might say, it has to be something that people could make second nature. That is, it becomes natural through a certain process of habituation. And anything that human beings just can't achieve or that requires warping human psychology right up to the breaking point, that's just going to be a non-starter as far as Hearst House is concerned. And then finally, this is sort of repeating some of what I've said here, uh, for something to be a virtue, it has to be something that we can understand children successfully learning so that by the time they become adults, it uh, has or can become second nature. Uh, it can't just be alien, and it also can't be the sort of thing that's just a matter of luck, right? You're either born with it or you're not. It has to be something that ordinary, reasonably well-functioning human beings with a reasonably good upbringing can come to reliably have. So here's a proposed environmental virtue. How about wonder? Or if we want to be more careful, we might say proper wonder. Now, wonder is an emotion, right? We feel wonder, we feel awe. Uh, and emotions are the underlying matter of the virtues, right? Uh, courage is a matter of feeling or not feeling fear. And uh, when it's appropriate to feel fear, nevertheless being able to control what your fear leads you to do. So is it plausible that we could have a stable disposition to feel wonder towards the right things in the right way at the right time for the right reasons in the same way that courage makes us feel or not feel fear in the right ways at the right times and so on. The idea here would be that nature is a proper object for the feeling of wonder, whereas the merely novel is not. Right? So uh, lots of us get interested by things we haven't seen before. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, lots of us also get interested or get smacked with a sense of, hey, something important is here when we see something like a majestic vista of the Rocky Mountains. So Hearst House is going to say, look, human marvels may well be appropriate objects of wonder, some of them anyway. Others are going to be merely novel, right? They're interesting for, or they should be interesting for 15 seconds. And then you're like, okay, well, this is, isn't really doing it for me anymore. One piece of evidence that wonder might be a real virtue is that it helps uh, calculate the degree to which we should see something as a mere novelty versus see something as warranting this feeling of, wow, look at that, over time. So uh, you could go wrong with respect to wonder if you get too interested in novelties or you get bored with things that really deserve wonder too quickly. And you would definitely be screwing things up if you feel wonder at something like a swimming pool on the 20th floor of uh, a high rise, but you don't feel any wonder at all at a mighty waterfall. Right? Uh, 
Hearst House is going to say that's a bad disposition, a vicious disposition, because you're feeling wonder at the wrong things at the wrong times. So wonder seems like a good emotion and proper wonder, having wonder in the right way at the right times for the right reasons, so on. Uh, that seems like a good virtue, but it's clearly not something that's only concerned with the environment. So it might be something that's kind of straddling our two categories. It's kind of a new virtue, but it's not really just an environmental virtue. So what about a virtue specifically in relation to nature? Here's a proposal from Hearst House. How about something like Taylor's respect for nature? Right? He calls this an attitude and indeed an ultimate moral attitude. But Hearst House thinks we can do better. We can actually fix things up for Taylor and basically give him credit for having a good idea, but then criticize him for not developing it the right way because he doesn't develop it as a virtue ethicist. Uh, so one way of seeing that there's this problem is you might ask, how do you come to have the attitude of respect for nature? How do you come to have an emotional response that we would explain by saying, this is the emotion I feel when I think about nature? Uh, Taylor seems to think that you just, it just happens. It just, you automatically adopt the attitude of respect for nature as soon as you recognize the inherent worth of all living things. Right? So this is his biocentric view. But Hearst House wants to say, look, fundamental moral beliefs uh, can certainly have transformative effects on one's attitudes. Uh, and uh, a belief like all life has inherent value that sounds like a fundamental or at least potentially fundamental moral belief, but even fundamental beliefs are not enough on their own to generate stable dispositions of character, uh, let alone morally virtuous ones. So in addition to the belief that's supposed to give this attitude, we need some more pieces of uh, machinery, if you'll forgive me for a bad metaphor to use in an environmental uh, ethics context, right? Uh, we need some of the mechanics that you get out of virtue ethics. So you could say one thing we need is practical wisdom. You need to know what counts as treating something as having inherent value. Uh, the mere fundamental belief that all life has inherent value doesn't tell you what counts as treating the things with fundamental value properly. So we need practical wisdom. Another thing you need is the ability to recognize in people or things that you don't like, maybe even that you despise, uh, you still need to be able to recognize their inherent value. So I think Hearst House would say, um, it's one thing to absolutely believe that all living things have inherent value. It's another thing to actually manifest that belief when you see a big nasty spider on the floor two feet away from you. Right? Um, that is going to if, if you're an arachnophobe or just generally don't like bugs, uh, you're either going to forget your belief that all living things have value, or you're not really going to care about that spider's intrinsic value. You just want it dead. So uh, there's this ability to hold on to your value judgment about life in the face of things that you despise. And generating a character trait that gives you a reliable disposition to not forget your commitment to the value of life. 
that's the kind of thing that you get out of character traits, out of virtuous dispositions. And the third thing you're going to need is emotional sensibilities that help you resolve conflicts between things of value. So uh, I won't try and gin up a complex philosopher's example, but I take it that we're presumably all on board with the idea that values can conflict, right? You sometimes have to make trade-offs of this valuable thing for that valuable thing, and you have to decide which one you're going to preserve and which one you're going to allow uh, to come to an end. Uh, well, your emotions are going to play into the kind of judgments that you make in cases where you have conflicts of value. And the mere fundamental value that all life has, uh, all life has value or all life calls for respect, that's not going to help you resolve these conflict cases. But more general dispositions of character will. So those are the kinds of things that we need to add to Taylor's general attitude of respect for nature. Right? If you take those things that we just had on the previous slide uh, and add those to the picture, then you get something that Hursthaus thinks does deserve to be called a specifically environmental virtue. Right? because it's the kind of thing that we can generate through moral habituation, uh, the kind of upbringing that virtue ethics emphasizes is necessary to be or become a virtuous person. But that's going to imply that Taylor is going wrong when he says, to go back a slide here, that just recognizing inherent worth will give you the attitude. Uh, Hursthaus's point is, no, it doesn't. You need the belief or the recognition of the importance of all life, but you need more than the attitude. You need the pragmatic, conflict-resolving sensibilities. You need prudence or practical wisdom to know how to apply this general value commitment to particular cases. Uh, so if you take respect for nature as an attitude, the way Taylor does, it just doesn't seem very effective at making us better people. But if you take it as a virtue, something that requires training and habituation, something that you have to shape yourself into having, uh, and in particular that you need to train until it's quote unquote second nature, that seems very promising to Hearst House that could be a new virtue. And this points us to a, a more fundamental problem with non-Eritaic ethical theories. So remember, uh, Erite or Arete, if you want the Greek pronunciation, right? That's the word that just generally gets translated as virtue. It literally just means excellence. But generally, when you hear ethicists talking about arete or the aretaic, what they mean is the virtuous or a virtue-based approach to ethics. So what's the problem with non aretaic ethical theories? Uh, if you look at Singer, Regan, Taylor, all of these people that try and grasp hold of inherent worth as their foundational premise or their foundational concept uh, to build their ethical theory on, you get this problem. Either this thing, inherent worth, comes in degrees or it doesn't. Uh, if it does come in degrees, then it's really easy to fall back into anthropocentrism. Or maybe I should say it's really easy to just never leave your anthropocentrism behind in the first place, because most people are just going to say, okay, well, sure, uh, non-human animals, maybe all living things, they have inherent worth, 
but normally functioning adult humans have more. They have the maximum amount of it and other things have less. Well, now you've lost the environmental bite of the concept, right? It, it's no longer really functioning to give you an environmental ethic. But if you do like Regan in particular, I mean, really Singer does this as well, but especially Regan, if you say uh, inherent worth does not come in degrees, it is all or nothing, uh, then it's hopelessly impractical. Hearst House is gonna say, look, none of us are prepared to extend the complete set of considerations that we give humans to every living thing. Uh, what could we eat at that point? If you thought that uh, cutting a uh, cutting a tomato off the vine is just as bad as cutting an arm off a human being, well, I guess you can't eat tomatoes anymore, but you can't eat any living thing. And uh, generally speaking, if we wait till things die on their own, they're generally not very good food for us anymore. <laughs> so if you really thought all living things have inherent worth and inherent worth is all or nothing. So if you have it, you deserve the exact same treatment as an, a normally functioning adult human being. How could you live anything even vaguely resembling a human life? But that's going to fall afoul of Hearst House's claim that uh, anything involved with ethics, anything that in, uh, has to do with virtues, has to fit with human psychology. So Singer, Regan, Taylor, they all end up either losing their environmentalist oomph or they make their moral system inhuman something that human beings just can't live by. But if we take inherent worth to mean something like gives us non-instrumental reasons, right? So if I say my cat Victor has inherent worth, what I mean is I, there are reasons for me to treat Victor certain ways uh, that are just dependent on Victor and the kind of creature he is, right? They're non-instrumental, so they're not about what I can get out of him. Then this problem of does it come in degrees or does it not actually disappears, right? We don't need a hierarchy where we say, okay, what has the most intrinsic value? Put them at the top of the pyramid. Okay, what has the next most intrinsic value? Put them one step below, right? Uh, we don't do that. And we don't find ourselves in this inhuman bind of saying, I have to treat every living thing just like I treat every other living thing because they all have intrinsic value, right? That would be the absolute equality option. Hearst House thinks if you're a virtue ethicist, you can say all living things and some non-living things have inherent worth. And that just means that they have reason-giving force. Uh, but how that reason-giving force manifests in different circumstances is going to be different. Right? Uh, it's not going to be the case that uh, if one thing is worth more than another thing in context A, it's necessarily also worth more in context B. Right? Um, if it comes to what I am going to do with the five bucks in my pocket, it might well be that I uh, use it to buy some catnip to give Victor. And if someone says to me, you know, you could have given that $5 to UNICEF, uh, you you could have given that money to some nonprofit that would buy mosquito nets to prevent malaria uh, in another country. I don't have to say, oh yeah, but I think my cat has more intrinsic value than those human beings, right? That doesn't sound like something I want to say. Uh, but I can say, look, in this particular instance, uh, I can take 
the fact that it'll make my cat happy as a reason to spend my five dollars and in some other circumstance i might say okay well i have to <laughs> victor has to forego his treats uh, because there's something more important that I have to do, but it's not going to be every context, the same thing wins every time. So that is supposed to be an advantage of virtue ethics, that it's much more context sensitive and it's not nearly as worried about making systematic hierarchies of value and it's also not concerned with the consequences of giving different things uh, perfectly equal claim to value the way someone like Regan is. So that's supposed to resolve one problem that uh, deontological theories and also many consequentialist theories have. Here's another problem that we might point to with Taylor and another way that we might solve it. Uh, Taylor's ethics, as he says, is biocentric. It is focused on the biological, the living. So it leaves out the non-living parts of nature. But you would think that a healthy respect for nature would lead us to value these non-living parts, or at least some of them. Uh, so uh, here again, the problem that Taylor faces is that he seems to be trying to find this one grand unifying property that he can use as the foundation for all intrinsic value and that he can then use to explain what to do in every single case. And what he comes up with as this grand unifying property is being a member of Earth's community of life, right? So all living things are in and all non-living things are out. If we make the move suggested on the last slide uh, and we say, look, don't worry about grand unifying properties. Uh, just say there are plenty of non-living things that give us non-instrumental reasons. So the intricacy of a spider's web gives us reason to feel wonder at it, to say, wow, that's really beautiful. Even if I don't want to come within 10 miles of the spider itself, I can at least appreciate the web. Or similarly, I can look at the Grand Canyon and be bowled over by its majesty. And that doesn't mean that I have to make some commitment to non-living things generally being just as important as living things, I'm just not going to be in the business of making these all-encompassing judgments the way Taylor seems to think that we need to. Okay, so these are supposed to be several, at least two, important advances that a virtue ethical approach to something like wonder could give us and the uh, some problems with Taylor's biocentric view that Hearst House's virtue ethics seems to fix up. The take home message about this is that we should say, look, there's a new contender when it comes to deciding on the best theoretical underpinning for being an environmentalist. Uh, most of the people that we've talked about or looked at so far thought you only have two options, consequentialism, deontology. Uh, Hursthouse says, here's a new contender, virtue ethics. And now she's laid out in some detail how that would fit with an environmentalist view of the world. Now, in some ways, it's almost an anti-theory. And some uh, people that do mainstream ethics definitely criticize virtue ethics for being anti-theory uh, because it denies the need for any grand unifying property. Virtue ethics just says be sensitive to value, be sensitive to how particular values interact in specific circumstances, and let that guide your actions and your emotional reactions.
But if that, and to some people that seems like a downside, right? That's, that's not giving us what a theory ought to give us. But maybe that's just because we've been blinded by a biased concept of what it takes to be doing theory. First House is gonna say, look, virtue ethics tells us all kinds of things about how the world works, things that you might call theoretical, right? It tells us we need moral habituation. We need settled dispositions of character. We need practical wisdom. Those are theoretical commitments. Um, and arguably, at least, those are theoretical commitments that are better at making us good environmentalists than uh, the stuff that these other theories that are supposedly more properly theory, uh, like deontology or consequentialism, right? Uh, the virtue ethical theoretical commitments arguably make us better environmentalists than what those other theories offer us. And that in itself, according to Hearst House, is going to mean that we should take virtue ethics seriously as a contender. All right, so that'll, that'll do for Hearst House. We're going to continue talking about uh, virtue ethics and uh, virtue ethical theory and applying it to environmental issues for several more classes, but we'll just continue on with that in the next lecture. Thank you all.